been able to attract an expert panel that we want to ensure that we have recorded in order that we will be able to webcast this session to many, many thousands of folks that are interested in this issue. I guess we only have to pick up the Washington Post this morning to read about the very large and enthusiastic rally on Capitol Hill yesterday. I'm told by our friend, Arlington County Board Member Walter Tejada, that over 40,000 folks rallied on the Capitol steps yesterday regarding the issue of immigration reform. This is an issue that's been around for an awful long time. I know that we spent eight years in the Clinton administration struggling with it and didn't get it right. We didn't get it right. President Bush came to office talking about his desire to address this matter of immigration, in particular immigration from south of our border. And now into, well into his fifth year, or I guess 55 years behind him, into his sixth year, again attempting to address the whole notion of immigration reform. A lot of issues, security issues, economic issues, human rights issues I think involved here, certainly a major impact on our community. Let me just mention that the issue hour is new, a new addition to the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series. It really came about as a result of a suggestion of participants that we gather 200, and by the way, we have well over 200 confirmed before lunch today, so we expect it again to be a capacity crowd. But the idea was is that why not schedule an hour for us to focus on an issue of critical importance to our community so that those that wanted to come early to lunch could assemble, hear from some of our community experts on an issue that they care about. So that was the reason for convening the issue hour. We're going to start where we start. I want to thank all of you for joining us. My expectation is that we'll grow the issue hour and that in not too long from now we'll see that these events also have a capacity crowd, and we're going to ask all of you to assist us in spreading that good word. But again, the first issue that we've selected is the issue of immigration reform. We have asked John Tristina, John with MALDEF, to provide us with a legislative overview. We'll leave it to John to explain that, but we have dueling bills. We've got lots of amendments, lots of possibilities as the Senate and others wrestle with this. I want to just give John a brief introduction before we ask him again for a ten-minute overview, and then we're going to turn to our panel, and I'll introduce them as well. John Tristina, for the past two decades, John has played a major policy role at the local and federal levels on immigration and civil rights matters affecting immigrants, women, and minority communities. He has written and spoken nationally on topics including immigrant workplace rights, English-only policies, constitutional law, immigration history, diversity, and education. I also would like to just share that I had the privilege of working with John in the Clinton administration as he served at the Department of Justice with Janet Rio. So, John, for a legislative overview. Thank you, Mickey, and good morning, everyone. It's great to be back in Washington, D.C., and when I think of Mickey in the years that we worked together in the Clinton administration, I always think of Mickey as a tower of power, both because that's the band that he and I both loved from the 60s in California, but also because it was such a remarkable thing to have a Latino in the White House advising the President of the United States, Janet McGee, our colleague, now President of NCLR. These are the type of people that I was able to work with in Washington, and we're now all serving the community directly 100 percent of the time. Myself at MALDEF, Janet at NCLR, Mickey and his good work, and I'm always happy to be in his company and in your company today because the issues that we're talking about, the issue of immigration, is front and center of tremendous, of tremendous importance. It's important to MALDEF in our work. We are largely litigating 
immigration issues as well as policy advocates in Washington, D.C. And some of the things that we have seen over the past 12 months really bring to life the issues facing immigrants. Up in New Hampshire last summer, we litigated a case. Two police chiefs decided to use this New Hampshire trespass laws against undocumented immigrants on the theory that they were trespassing, that is, they were in New Hampshire when they weren't supposed to be. A novel interpretation of the trespass laws, and we felt that if it was going to be allowed there, if it was going to be used there, it could be used in small towns across the United States. So we went up to New Hampshire. We worked with the attorney representing the eight individuals who were arrested, and we presented to the court the issues of federalism, the issues that the federal government is responsible for enforcement of immigration laws, not local chiefs of police, not state governments. And the judge accepted our argument, and not only did he throw out the charges against those eight individuals, but he also said anybody else who's charged with this, their charges will be thrown out as well. And that is a message that the reason why these chiefs of police did this, they were frustrated with the federal government. We are frustrated with the federal government. But there's a right way of immigration enforcement, and there's a wrong way. Some of the other things that are coming up currently, last week I was debating on CNN the district attorney of Phoenix, Maricopa County, who has now his latest thing that he's fighting against are services for DOI defendants, people who have been convicted of drunk driving. Now in Maricopa County they have a special program. If you're Spanish speaking, if you're more familiar with Native American languages, then you get your counseling, you get your rehabilitation in that language. It's a successful program. The National Association of Counties has heralded this program as innovative. The innovative idea of talking to individuals in a language they understand. This program has a better success rate than the English language program. Within 12 months, 88% of the people who are on this program graduate from it and are better drivers, and we're all safer from it. The English language program, it takes 17 months, and only two-thirds of the people successfully graduate. Yet here is a district attorney who is playing with public safety over the immigration issue, over language issues, and we need to recapture the argument. We need to recapture the argument, and doing so in the immigration bill is particularly important. Now our opponents say that America's security is at stake in the immigration debate, and our opponents also say that the American way of life is at stake in the immigration debate. They are accurate in their assessment, but they are completely wrong in their policy choice. They are completely wrong in their policy choice, because America's security is jeopardized, not strengthened, by the Sensenbrenner bill that passed the House last December. And the future of all families is dependent upon immigration, not threatened by it. Every family, every business, every community in this nation has a direct effect on immigration, and vice versa. Immigrants have a direct effect on every family, every business, and every community. In my work at the Justice Department, I used to give a speech about the old Andy Griffith show. It took place in Mayberry, the mythical Mayberry. Actually, Mayberry was actually an actual city, Siler City, North Carolina. And the days of Don Knotts and Andy Griffith and Opie and Ronnie Howard, they're long gone, because today in Siler City, the elementary school is 30% Latino. The kindergartens are 50% Latino. And this is a small town in North Carolina. The teacher staff, the principals, the school administrators are still, you'll rarely find a Latino name there. But we're changing communities throughout the country. We're changing them for the better. And that's really what's at stake in the immigration bill. It's time that we stood up and said that we need immigrants as much as they need American opportunity and freedom. No immigrant is asking for a free ride. Every American, including immigrants, benefits when they have a legal opportunity to come, to work, to stay, to contribute, and take part in America. Some of the specifics, rather than looking at this solely as an immigration issue, looking upon it as jobs in the American economy. The top 25 occupations are going to grow by a million jobs every year for the next eight years. That's three quarters of a million retail salespeople, half a million new teachers, 700,000 new nurses, 325,000 nursing aides, 376,000 waiters and waitresses, the same in food workers, a quarter of a million office clerks, a quarter of a million laborers, 
a quarter of a million information clerks and receptionists, 223,000 truck drivers, 186,000 carpenters. The list goes on. Those are just a few of the occupations that are growing. We cannot fill those jobs with people born in the United States solely. American-born workers are sometimes unwilling, sometimes unable, clearly too few to fill those jobs. Uh, and, and if we're going to be able to have an economy that sustains us, all of us, it's going to be dependent upon immigration and dependent upon a legal way. So that we are a better nation than one that would accept the labor of Im immigrant workers but deny them equal rights and, and the dignity of, of, of legal labor. Today, American families are living on the economic edge. Uh, they live between making it and losing it. And that line is often a very thin line. Whether you live in Bethesda or Brownsville or Herndon or Houston, American families are doing more than ever. They've had to do more than, than they've ever had to do. And now we're doing it on, on, on two incomes. Used to be that there was a one income family and if there was a crisis, the other person, the other person in the family, the other adult in the family would, would, would go to work and, 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 and fill in to create, to fill that gap. Uh, economic gap or health gap or whatever gap. Now we've lost that. We've lost that margin. Uh, we've lost that safety margin. Uh, income, individual incomes are going up, but so are fixed costs. Mortgages, insurance, car payments. There's been a 72% drop in discretionary income, uh, even when there's two families, even when there's two incomes in, in a family. The United States families survive because of low food costs, service availability, and the lo lower cost of manufactured goods. These costs are low because of immigrant workers. And take that silent support system away that immigrants provide, as the Sensenbrenner, might, Sensenbrenner bill uh, would, 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 would cause to take place. Uh, and, and we're really having a devastating effect on every American family. Now, Gabby Lemos from, from LULAC is, is, is uh, in Washington all the time, and she's up on the specifics of the immigration bills that are now pending in the Senate. That passed the bill that passed in the House. I just want to mention one other one other issue. And as I said earlier, Maldiv litigates. We are at heart the legal organization. We consider ourselves the law firm for the Latino community. There's one other issue that that was 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 threatened to be added to the House bill and may be added to the Senate bill uh, as as the Senate Judiciary Commit considers the McCain-Kennedy bill, the, the, the Specter uh, Chairman's Mark, and and, and the Cornyn Kyle bill. Uh, that is one other issue, and that is the issue of birthright citizenship. Birthright citizenship. And while our opponents are trying to build a wall on the U.S.-Mexico border, they're also trying to dismantle the Constitution. And the birthright citizenship issue is the one that makes it most clear. Birthright citizenship, what I mean by that is every person born in the United States is a United States citizen by virtue of that birth. This is not a rule that we just set up to, to, to cater to, to, to immigrants. It's not a rule that was recently established. This rule has its origins in Anglo-American law long before the Revolutionary War. It dates back to 1608 in, in Scotland. The principle that if you're born in the country, you're a citizen of that country. Now, other nations do it in different ways. Japan does it. So if, you're, if you're Japanese, then you're going to be Japanese. And if you're not Japanese, it doesn't matter how long you've been in Japan, you're not going to become Japanese. That's, that's the, that's the uh, granting citizenship by your bloodline. We do it by where you're born. We've done it that way since 1608, except when it became inconvenient to us as a society, when it came to African Americans, when we said three-fifths of a person uh, for census purposes in, 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 the, in the first census, in the first constitution, or the issue of slavery. It wasn't until the 14th Amendment that, we're, that we as a society were able to get over that and say that, no, all 14th Amendment, everybody born and naturalized in the, in, in the U.S. Then it came to Asian Americans and Native Americans. In 1898, 108 years ago this month, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in the, U in the case of Wong Kim Ark that the principle of birthright citizenship applies to everybody born in the U.S. Now, Wong Kim Ark was a young man born in San Francisco. He went on a trip in the 1880s to, to, to China, came back in, and the, and the government said to him, well, you can't come in, Chinese Exclusion Act. He says, well, I'm not coming in. I'm coming home. I'm born in San Francisco. I'm coming back. Uh, left my heart here. As it turns out, they said, no, you can't come in because you're, you're not really a citizen. Your parents couldn't become citizens of the U.S., therefore you can't either. It doesn't matter whether you're born here or not. He took that case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court was very, very clear 
the birthright citizenship, the principle applies to all people born in the United States. That's the principle. And, then, and that's a constitutional principle. And now we see on the House and Senate side uh, some members of Congress by statute trying to amend the Constitution and, as I say, dismantle the Constitution. This is an issue we're going to continue to fight and because we stand for many traditional American principles in all of our immigration discussions. Uh, MALDEF, LULAC, NCLR, the Latino community stand four square behind uh, immigrants contributing to the country, uh, making the country better, uh, keeping our Constitution uh, intact. Uh, so those are the principles by which we then enter into the immigration debate, into the specifics. Uh, so I'll stop there, and I'll turn this over to Gabby, or we'll turn it back to Mickey uh, for further introductions. But I appreciate uh, having the opportunity to share with you some thoughts on immigration, really looking at it in a way of how we contribute to America on a day-to-day -day basis. We're going to win this fight. It may, it may not be done this year. Every immigration bill that has passed in the last 25 years has taken more than one Congress to pass. With all of this is going on, perhaps there's too much going on in the House and Senate, and they should just get some ideas, discuss it, debate it, come back next year and really refine it, have a much better discussion. Uh, but those are some of the options. That's what's going on in Washington on immigration, and I'm happy to join with you today. Thank you. Well, thank John. I, I know that everyone agrees MALDEF is truly one of our champions of civil rights, and in particular, champions of our Latino community, and we're delighted John is with us. Now, we've got two panel members, and then we're going to open it up. I get a sense, most of you I know in this audience, that you all have something to say about this issue. And we want to give you an opportunity to say that and have some dialogue with our panelists. So we're going to ask both uh, Gabriela uh, as well as Jorge to limit their comments to about five minutes, and then we're going to really open it up. Let me just mention uh, Dr. Gabriela Limas, policy director of LULAC. And her boss is in the room, so be good to her, Brent Wilkes. But I can tell you this, I'm sure Brent agrees, there's not a harder worker in Washington, D.C. than Gabriela Limas. Setting her resume aside and all this, I mean, she is a person that works day in and day out for our community. Uh, really leading the charge in so many ways for a major organization, LULAC, nationally. And we're just delighted. This is an issue she feels very strongly about. Gabriela Limas. <laughs> well, good morning. Muy buenos días a todos. As always, it's a pleasure for me to be here and talk about this thing, because Mickey's right, this is something I'm quite passionate about. Uh, being that I'm an immigrant myself, so it's, it's personal. Um, but it's also, it's more than that. It's really about the future of our nation, and it's about the future of the Americas as we know it, um, and what all these globalization processes have meant uh, over the past, well, I mean, we, we heard about the Chinese Exclusion Act that goes back to the 1800s, but there were many exclusion acts. Uh, Japanese-American Gentlemen's Agreement, for example. And when I think about immigration, I always look at it historically and what it has meant for the growth of the United States in terms of the diversity of our populations. As at the end of the day, almost every single one of us here is an immigrant on some level or another. I think John made some very powerful points, um, as John always does. Um, and um, I guess what I would also like to share with you is some other concepts with regards to some shifts and trends that we've been seeing that change kind of how this debate is taking place. Because it's not just, I think there's a, a stereotype about who immigrants are. And we tend to think that it's male, single, single males from Mexico or Central America from the ages of maybe 18 to uh, 30. Well, that's not true. Increasingly, we've seen a huge shift in women being immigrants in this country, and that is different from anything we have seen in the past. We also see that there is a large population of immigrants, that it's not just from Latin America, that it's from all over the world, that we have immigrants here probably from every single country in the world. And you see that a lot when you go to the educational systems in places like San Diego County or Florida or uh, Miami, Florida, excuse me, or um, but even smaller towns like Little Rock, Arkansas or, or Memphis, Tennessee. Oops, I think the Memphians are going to get mad at me. But um, 
the point being that at any given moment, you may have anywhere from 25 to 70 odd languages represented in the school system. And that's the reality of youth in immigration because, again, we're also seeing a lot of children who are immigrating trying to get together with their parents who may already be here. I want to share some data with you with regards to women because I found this very striking. Um, with regards to remittances going back to Mexico alone, more than 60% of the $20 billion in remittances are now being sent by women as opposed to the 39% being sent by men. And this comes from the Colegio de la Frontera Norte. There's some research that they're doing there. That's a huge change and shift in trends. And that has, carries with it the implication that you're seeing a lot of young single women also emigrating, looking for opportunity. Many of these young women happen to be highly educated. This is also a difference in trends because that also implies that they're looking for higher level positions. Women accounted for 25% of the nearly 4,000 migrants who died while attempting to cross the U.S.-Mexico border since the uh, putting into place Operation Guardian or Guardian um, in 1994. That's, again, that's a huge number of individuals, which tells me that this is bigger than just a domestic policy. And I tend to look at this as an international policy. I think, on the one hand, uh, from an economic perspective, we're always looking to grow our economy. We're always looking south. Well, actually, we look everywhere, because like I started this off by talking about globalization. And um, we're inviting different countries to be our economic partners. At the same time, we're looking at bills like the Sensenbrenner bill in the House, which is talking about putting up a wall. We are asking for cooperation in counterterrorism from every individual in the Americas, and yet we are putting up a wall. Um, and I keep coming back to that because um, that wall is a symbol, and I've heard it uh, sort of compared to the wall in Berlin, whereas other nations are tearing down walls, we're setting one up or we're talking about setting one up, and that is not a good precedent, especially when we talk about issues like counterterrorism because every nation has a different level of engagement and need depending on the threat. And that's something that we need to bear in mind. Now, having said that, um, I think from uh, an economic perspective, what are the costs of some of these bills? Uh, the discussion from the Sensenbrenner bill with regards to shipping back undocumented somewhere between 8 and 11 million, I've heard as high as 15 million. We're talking about $41 billion a year. That is more than the entire budget of the Department of Homeland Security. So it's a costly bill just from the, you know, sending people back. From the perspective of the wall, how many millions of dollars per mile is it going to cost? Again, very expensive. How much is it going to cost us in terms of economic flows? And those numbers I haven't seen, but I can imagine it's a lot. When I was in Chula Vista a couple weeks ago, Chula Vista is on the border with Mexico, um, I was speaking to one of their state senators, and she's telling me, we're trying to open up the border to commerce and trade so that we can have growth and development. I know I've seen this in El Paso. I've seen it with, you know, the, the nexus between El Paso Juarez, the Laredos. So there's a lot of discussion about economic viability and growing our economy. And, you know, at the same time, we're hearing discussions about, you know, possible recession and that the U.S. downturn of the economy. So these are ways that we can grow our economy, and instead we're talking about putting walls up. So, again, I, I need to think about the logic of all of this, and I ask all of you to also think about that logic. From a human rights perspective, what we've seen since the passage of the Operation Guardian on the border is more and more deaths on the border. This is not a good thing. This is a human rights issue, and we need to think about that. 1,700 dead, or in this case, some of the data I've seen is more than um, 4,000. That's very high, and that's, that's, that shouldn't be happening. That shouldn't be happening. Now, are there challenges with the growth in immigration? Yes, we have to be honest. There are. There are challenges. Where do you feel it first? When you see a new immigrant community or new growth in communities, because they're not all necessarily immigrants, some of them are migrant communities. It's people from L.A. moving westward or eastward. It's, you know, big cities moving into suburbs. There's always a challenge. You're going to feel it in your school systems. You're going to feel it in your health care system. You're probably going to feel it in your criminal justice system. 
We're talking about state and local law enforcement getting engaged on federal immigration law enforcement. That's crazy. These police officers are so stretched as it is just to keep the public safety. So now it's not just public safety, it's national security that they're being asked to engage on. So I would say let's consider the resources that are available given the deficits that are realistically in place that we have seen. The actuality of the matter is we're seeing great contributions. Uh, about two day, Monday, today's Wednesday, right? Yeah. Monday there was a study that came out of Berkeley, I believe. I haven't been able to get my hands on it, but what I saw initial data was that wages, real wages go up 3 to 4 percent in communities where there's immigrant workers. Well, that is positive. That tells me that we're seeing a contribution to the economy, and that's something, again, that is positive. So we need to emphasize more on the positives and less on the negatives. I think um, my last point would be it's not just a domestic issue. It's an international issue. And our tendency in the United States is to view this as domestic. The reality is with the integration of economies, it's not just trade, it's not just finance, it's also peoples. Peoples tend to move back and forth. What we've seen since the placing of these strong security measures, or what are interpreted as security measures, I mean, to me, it's the failed drug war. I am not seeing anything different, and drugs are still flowing. So I don't see any changes that are going to happen uh, from that perspective. But I think what we need to do is engage with our neighbors who are our economic partners, who are our, our, they're our neighbors. And instead of talking about closing down borders, we need to talk about how we can create and generate more cooperation that makes sense. I know that Mexico has engaged with Belize and Guatemala to talk about their southern border so that there's more security. Looking at issues of, you know, separate crime from national security. They're two different issues, and we need to be clear on that. If we address them in a concerted way that makes sense, if we look at the 9-11 Commission and the work that they put out, I think we can find a lot of responses. There's already been some very logical steps. There's a roadmap in certain bills that we've seen put into place that address both the flows of peoples and commerce and trade as well as their integration into the community, uh, as well as the national security perspectives. And I'm thinking specifically of the Kennedy-McCain bill. There's a lot of good stuff in there. It's a roadmap, something we can follow and we can engage on. Um, I think going the other route is only going to get us into a very – you know, it's going to cause a lot more challenges for us on an international level. It's going to cause a lot more challenges for us on a cooperation level. And we're going to end up with more hate in this country because every country where I've seen strong guest worker programs, you have enclaves of people who are separated out, who live separately. Look at what just happened in France. There's a lot of violence. I don't want that for this nation. I want to see something that's positive where we all are integrating, where we're working together, and we're forming stronger communities. Thank you. I'm going to guess that there's a lot more of us in this room that certainly know Gabriela, but also John Trisfini as well, than know our next panel member, Jorge Urzuli, uh, from the People for the American Way. I'm delighted to have Jorge here with us for a number of reasons, including that I think you're going to hear a lot more about Jorge in the future. One of the responsibilities that Jorge embraced at the People for the American Way was most recently standing up an organization, Mi Familia Vota, responsible for registering thousands. In fact, uh, they sought to register 50,000 in this last election, Hispanics, and exceeded that $50,000 or 50,000 registration objective by 22,000. They reached 72,000. Those of us in this business for some time of speaking to our community about the necessity for us to register and vote, understand what a huge jump start to our po full political empowerment would result from our community doing more in this arena. Uh, we've asked Jorge to address this topic really from the ground level, based on the experience in working with our people, uh, many of them new immigrants, as it relates to registration and their political empowerment. Jorge? Thank you. If it's okay with everyone, I'll just uh, sit. It's a small enough group, um, and uh, I just kind of prefer to do that. First of all, thank you, uh, Mickey. It's a, it's a 
not only is it a pleasure being here, it's also an honor. Uh, uh, you know, the more you do this work, one of the values of it, if it's not because we're getting real wealthy, it's because you're meeting phenomenal people that, uh, that uh, have contributed to the history of our country, and you meet great people that will contribute to the history of our country tomorrow, and, and that exchange and that interaction is really uh, a quality of life issue for me, so it's really, really a pleasure to be here. Um, you, you know, I will say that I'm not an immigration expert. I'm an immigration student. I am somebody who's had an immigrant experience as an immigrant to this United, to these, to these United States. But immigrant, the immigration experience changes on a daily basis. And what we knew yesterday about what was happening at XYZ border or at XYZ raft coming across the Caribbean uh, is changing uh, every day. The demographics are changing. The situations are changing. The political reactions are changing from our, both our friends and our foes. It's important to understand that we talk about um, immigration and sometimes in a way and make assumptions that are, we know what the foes are saying. You know, those that are on a particular side of the political spectrum who um, are easily disparaging of folks that don't look and sound uh, like them. Um, it's a little more difficult to understand the lack of understanding and lack of support from those individuals that historically have supported um, civil rights and who have, who have historically understood the, the fight and the battles of the have-nots. Immigration doesn't always cross those lines. And one of the things that we're finding and one of the things I think we have to be very aware of is that this is not one of those issues where progressives are completely on board. And it's, it's, it's an uncomfortable situation. They are not going to respond in a disparaging way like some of the folks on the, more, on, on, on the sort of the right wing side. But it's there, and the feelings are there. And that feeling that we get that this thing is dragging and that it's so obvious the system is broken, why aren't we fixing it, comes because there's a lot of backroom door conversations with people who traditionally are with us on five out of ten or eight out of ten issues who are still holding their finger up and watching which way the wind is blowing and trying to understand how it is that this impacts them. And really, if they let all these people in and they actually make them actually full-fledged human beings that participate in the democracy, what's going to happen to the country that they know? I mean, will people still learn about Paul Revere? Will it be the same flag? You know, will uh, you know? Will there be more Spanish language radio stations? Like uh, they're not real clear, and so that hesitancy that you're seeing on this is really part of that, because it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure that our immigration system is broken. It's completely broken. It has been for some time. It's not. It's not a news bulletin. People have been hiring undocumented folks to take care of their kids and clean their homes and their yards and there for decades. So this sort of hypocrisy that all of a sudden now it's like an issue just underscores the fact that people aren't necessarily, uh, you know, like, like many of the rights movement. You know, when, when folks were hiding and closeted and, you know, not demanding their full share of the pie, you know, people were more willing to sort of, you know, tolerate them with a wink and a nod. But when people want to stand up and be counted and be represented and, and have a full-fledged uh, manner in which they participate in this democracy, and that's when people say, well, wait a minute. Now that's going to change the dynamics of what I live and what I do. And so um, I've been charged with talking to you about what we do with Mi Familia Vota and Acción, which is really the, the, the C4 branch of the operation. Um, as, you, as, as Mickey suggested, we had a very successful run in, uh, um, in Florida. It was a Florida operation. Uh, we started in '04 and registered these great numbers of people. We polled at 88 percent voter turnout. Uh, '05, we collaborated with uh, lots of allied organizations. Uh, and this operation, of which ultimately was of uh, all immigrants, the average what we had in the team of leaders that ultimately sort of surfaced out of the 04 election, 
We had uh, about 35 folks that were the core. Uh, the youngest was uh, 21, the oldest was 62, there were 18 nationalities. And in 05, we began to sort of look at the local issues that they wanted as leaders to continue to develop their critical thinking skills around, and this immigration issue was one of them. And so what we did is we were the ground operation for the New American Opportunity Campaign, which supports the Kennedy McCain bill um, uh, that uh, you heard about. And um, I would just say that my own personal opinion is, is that McCain-Kennedy bill is just the best I've seen. Why? Because it does three basic things. It, you know, it, it takes care of the 11 million people that are here and gives them a pathway to citizenship. I say I'm an immigrant student because when I came to the United States, there was an immigrant process. I knew the number of years I had till I became a resident. We literally counted them down in my house. And then we knew the number of years that we had till we became U.S. citizens. And, you know, and it was a, it was a thing. It was a, you know, just like, you know, your dad, it's like my dad used to measure how high I was on the wall with a pencil. It was kind of that same family kind of thing. Folks don't have that. So there's, there's a, you know, there's a, as all of you know in this room, there's an array of people that are, that are visa that wind up staying, people that come here undocumented, for people that are just waiting, or people that would like to be U.S. citizens, but can't because they can't afford the 400 and somewhat dollars for that process. So there's a whole, you know, mix of, of folks that that are here um, that need that pathway to citizenship. So this bill provides a pathway to citizenship for those that are here undocumented. You know, it slaps them on the hand and says, okay, you've been bad. You're going you're gonna to pay $2,000, and, you know, we're going to put you through this little, you know, ringer so that we're not making a statement that it was okay for you to come here illegally. We're actually going to punish you, but now we're going to give you a pathway to citizenship. It also says, okay, border enforcement is very important, and we're going to do X, Y, Z things to enforce that border. And then we're going to take care of all of our business uh, uh, interests in this country, and we're going to have a guest worker program. That's going to ensure that, you know, businesses, you know, uh, are taken care of. Right. And so, you know, that's a start. It's a strong point of departure. It really deals with all those three things. Problem is, is that most people don't know, you know, the details of immigration. I mean, you pull people out on the street to tell you what the difference between the McCain bill is and the Fensenbrenner bill is and the whatever bill is, and you get a headache just listening to people on C-SPAN trying to figure this whole thing out for them. So one of the things that's very important is how do our own people understand it? How do, our, how do we prevent our own folks from not drinking the Kool-Aid and walking down the wrong path? And so what Mi Familia Vota and Exxon tried to do, or what we did, we went out and spoke door to door to all of our folks and basically um, told them what the bill was and what the three, why this bill was so important and why they had to participate and why they had to get engaged. And, uh, um, and uh, we, the deliverable at the door was we, we generated 17,000 handwritten letters in Florida. Um, uh, and we specifically wanted them handwritten. They were very, very, uh, uh, I think, uh, productive. We managed in Florida to get uh, Democrats and Republicans alike. We got Lincoln Diaz-Ballard, Mario, Ileana, we got Mel Martinez. Um, we had Debbie Wasserman Schultz on the Democratic side uh, in support of the sister bill, uh, Kendrick Meek. Um, um, we, uh, we were short on our, our Democratic senator, which is a whole other discussion to have on another day. But, um, but we were very successful, I think, in, in letting them know that individuals across the board, not one nationality, not one neighborhood, not one, that people across the board were now informed and they had a handwritten letter in their possession. We would show up to their office with stacks of letters this big. Um, because sometimes elected officials believe that, that you know, these issues are a little too complicated for the average Joe, and they tend to be right. And so our job is, I think, amongst, within this immigrant uh, dialogue in the next, whether it's the next two years, five years, ten years, is to figure out ways to reduce it to the simplest of terms, because people on the ground obviously are impacted by this. Now, you don't have to be an immigrant yourself. You could be married to one, or your daughter could be married to one, or, you know, your, your cousin, or, you know, everybody has one to six degrees of separation from somebody that's here undocumented, if you're Hispanic. Uh, it's just the way it is, so it doesn't have to be you. You understand what those situations are. So, um, I would just uh, uh, say that uh, our hope is that 
that we continue to figure out ways that uh, part of the dialogue has to ha have here is uh, one, an understanding that progressives aren't with us in, in the numbers that sometimes people think they are. They're just not. Um, we have to do a much better job of explaining and articulating and engaging them. And one way to seriously do that is to get our own folks, our own communities in those progressive areas to, to rise up and not make assumptions that, they're, that we're okay in those areas. Our people themselves have to understand what's at stake here for them and for their future. Um, you know, we're about to expand into uh, the next three years into eight states. Uh, this 06, we're, we're, as we speak, expanding right now in Arizona and in, Phil and, uh, and in Pennsylvania. And um, we plan on doing this work in those states as well. And uh, obviously those communities are different. The community in, in Phoenix is different from, and, and Tucson are different from the ones in Florida as they are different from the ones in the Lehigh Valley area in Philly where we'll be. But all of us as Hispanics, you know, and somebody said, well, somebody said to me the other day, well, how are Puerto Ricans going to care? Well, because Puerto Ricans are also married to Guatemalans and El Salvadorans and, you know what I mean, they have the same issues that we do. Uh, and they're smart enough to know that t together is how we sort of solve these problems. So uh, we hope to continue to do that kind of work, and, uh, and I guess I'll close it down. Thank you. Okay, we've now heard from uh, our panel, John, Gabriela, and Jorge. Now it's your turn. Uh, this is an opportunity to ask a question of any of our panel members, but also an opportunity for you to make a, a brief comment. If you would simply stand, uh, if you'd share your name with us, if there's an affiliation you'd care to share as well, we would appreciate that. Before I call on our, our first uh, person to ask a question or make a comment, though I want to recognize an elected official that has joined us, a very dear friend of mine, someone who, who deals with this issue of immigration reform every single day, Supervisor Mary Rose Wilcox of Maricopa County, right here at the back of the room. Okay, who's first? Alberto? Please stand and not about young brown males only, which is what that big picture in that front page implies. And um, we were discussing that at, at, in El Tiempo uh, uh, newsroom this morning. Obviously, our front page is going to be on the same issue. The picture is going to be different. Um, because the issue is about, uh, as Gabriela said, millions of people who've been here for years, who work, who, who contribute. And it's also about through my, my experience in this country as an immigrant, uh, it's also about families who are condemned to use the services of coyotes to reuni reunite with their children. Um, anyway, that's, that's the comment. The quick question is, um, 1986, President Ronald Reagan amnesty for three million people, people who now are overwhelmingly US citizens. In today, today's environment, in, the, in Capitol Hill. It is like an allergic reaction to the word amnesty. Um, what is going on? Um, and uh, last question is what to do, and this is out of a conversation with President Saca of El Salvador a few days ago during coffee. What is going on with these wonderful and generous programs like TPS that end up being what I would like, a jail in limbo, where are we going to send 
hundreds of thousands of, pe of people who have been here already for years under the TPS back home? Are they going to be part of the 400,000 uh, visas that the McCain bill contemplates? Well, then you have them TPS. Where, where are the others? Where, where are we going to do with the others? So these are the two questions. The uh, allergic reaction to words like amnesty and the TPS. Okay, good. Thank you, Alberto. This is past the microphone here. So that we can record this in the future, we're just going to ask folks to come up and use the microphone and face the camera, and that will help us record it better. Gabriela? Well, I think, um, I think both the TPS and amnesty share a similar kind of situation. Um, unfortunately, we get caught in semantics. And um, the media, I think, has, um, you know, writ large has, has kind of shifted languaging um, in large part because organizations like FAIR, the Federation for American Immigration Reform, have been successful in getting their message out that amnesty was a bad thing and that it caused new immigration, uh, which is, does not take into consideration the reality of what happened in the 80s and 90s with global economies where we saw huge shifts uh, and, and those are the push factors. Plus, we saw a huge growth in the United States, which was the draw factor. We also saw, uh, you know, natural disasters in, you know, countries like Central America, uh, not countries, excuse me, continents, um, and, um, you know, hurricanes, uh, mudslides, et cetera, et cetera. We also, you know, the reality is there was some leftovers from the 80s in terms of civil war, et cetera. So this was, again, push factors. Um, TPS, unfortunately, is temporary, and, and from the get-go, it was always viewed as temporary. I don't think um, the intention was ever for it to be permanent. The challenges are in the, some of the bills, and maybe John can talk about this in the past, uh, where there have been mechanisms put into place that cause stoppages, that cause little glitches, and things that have been taken out, like 245i which was a mechanism that was supposed to allow people to reinstate their status. Um, those kinds of conversations are what we need to talk about when we look at legislation. What kind of mechanisms can we reintroduce? The unfortunate side is, going back to your amnesty issue, is that the rhetoric is very negative. And, um, I mean, we've talked a lot about earned legalization, where you earn your pathway. And amnesty kind of, you know, the, the languaging is, oh, you know, they're lawbreakers, don't give them anything. The reality is, you know, you got to look at, you know, the, the punishment should match the crime. And right at this point, you know, I mean, unless certain parties have their way, I mean, this is not a felony. So, again, we need to be realistic. But I think we also need to be real, um, reasonable as well as realistic. And that's where the challenges are lying at this point. I think we need to uh, try to get a hold of that languaging and, and move it, you know, towards something that is more um, understandable, I think, for the vast majority of, of our communities. Mm -hmm. Joe? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add briefly, I think um, the two issues, as, as Gabriella outlined, the TPS is, is a legal issue, the, the amnesty is, is more of a political one. In terms of the legal one, Yes, very, by its nature, the TPS is a temporary protected status. Uh, however, traditionally, once you get, temp you get TPS, there's always been an effort to adjust people's status after that. We did it for Polish people, we did it for Irish, we've done it for a lot of different groups, not TPS itself, but other temporary programs, Liberians and others. So the, it becomes more of a foreign policy issue when you move from TPS into permanent status, and that's one where the countries of origin and the, the national governments need to make that case on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. In terms of the political, the, the issue of amnesty, I think the Republican Party went through the same kind of dialogue and internal debate as they're doing today. Uh, and and, and the, the President Reagan side prevailed, the, the pro-business side, that said this is going to be good for us, and hopefully it's going to be good for the Republican Party. Now, it, it didn't benefit the Republican Party, uh, the, the amnesty program, um, because of the Pete Wilson intervention of what he did in, in, in California Prop 187, Completely turned off uh, uh, Republicans, new citizens to, uh, to to the to the Republican Party. So now, when the Republican Party looks at uh, issues of amnesty and legalization, it's the same internal discussion. You've got Senator McCain and Senator Hagel on one side. You've got Senator Cornyn and Kyle on the other side. It's still an internal debate, uh, but I think it becomes more of a political debate within that party rather than 
rather than one of legal or policy or immigration issues. Thank you. Other questions? Let's see if we can get some other questions or, again, comments that anyone would care to make. Joe Garcia. Joe? Please come up and face the camera so that will be easier for as we record this. Thank you. Yeah, the question is the fight. You know, obviously the realistic possibility of passing this out this year is very tough. I know, obviously, we want to be optimistic. So I ask from all three of you, sort of give me a, and in particular Maldef, which will probably be in charge of carrying out the legal, a lot of the legal challenges that will come stem off not solving this problem. And I think you'll have to find some test cases and work it out as you have in the past. But the broader question is where are we? You know, if you look back at the civil rights struggle, you know, you get ruled on the front end, but eventually history proves you're right. It was the right thing to do. Are we at that stage? I mean, are we about to get ruled? This problem is not going to be solved by pushing it back, and racist stuff isn't going to go through. So where is it that we find ourselves, and where do we find ourselves in a political angle? Should, you know, should this fight be had to lose so that in the end we win? If you understand my question, in other words, where are we in that battle? Thank you, Joe. John? It's a tough calculation that, that we as leaders in the community and, and, and organizations uh, have really have to evaluate, and it changes a lot in Washington on a day-to-day -day basis. I would say that uh, just as an immigration matter, as a policy matter, the more time it takes for the House and Senate to really deliberate and come up with some policy decisions, uh, the better. Uh, the House bill went through, was introduced early in one week, and it was on the House floor by the end of that week. That is, not the, that is not the environment in which you pass thoughtful legislation where issues can be worked out and debated and discussed. The Senate approach, now so we have the Majority Leader Frizz threatening this Judiciary Committee Chairman is going to take away jurisdiction of the bill. That's virtually unprecedented to, have, to, to not let the committee do its work. This is the committee today. It's got 30 amendments from just one senator on one, on one title of the bill. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. I'm optimistic. I used to work up on the Senate Judiciary Committee. I'm optimistic that that committee can work its way. You've got Kennedy in the room. You've got Kyle in the room. You've got, you've got the key senators in the room who know this stuff and, and, and can really elevate the discussion into coming up with something thorough and something positive. However, the Judiciary Committee may lose that opportunity come March the 27th. We, we, that remains to be seen. Uh, in the long term, uh, more discussion need, need, needs to be developed. And uh, there are some things. It, it's not just a comfort of saying, well, we'll wait out the clock and we don't have to get anything done. We need reform on immigration. We need the DREAM Act, an opportunity for students to adjust their status if they go to community college, if they are in a four-year school, if they, if they enter into the military to serve this country. So there are affirmative things that we need uh, as a community in terms of changes in immigration. So it's not just a matter of sitting back and saying, hopefully, hopefully there's a train wreck and between the House and Senate nothing gets done. Uh, but if, if, if history is any precedent, then there will, the, 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 there will not be a bill this year. It will take a second Congress to get the job done. That's what happened when we got the, the, the 86 Act. It happened in 90, happened in 96, and uh, I think it will happen again this time. John, would you let the board make a comment, and we'll come back to Gabriela. You know, I don't think this is any different than a lot of the other movements. You know, like whether it's the suffrage movement or the civil rights movement, there were always folks within those communities that thought, ah, you know, don't make too much because you know we already have this little, this little existence the way we have it. We don't want to rock the boat because it's going to make things a little more complicated. The gay rights movement was the same way. There was always a group of people that said, you know, just be careful how you go forward and. I don't think this is any different, and I think the one thing that I would like to, to add to that in terms of where the movement is, the movement is at a place where we have to organize our people, the people that are most impacted by this, our own families, and those of us who have our U.S. citizenship in our pockets or were born here and whose parents gave us that luxury, you know, need to recognize that we have to be out on that front line along with these folks that are less empowered. You know, the things, uh, and uh, I know Supervisor uh, Wilcox is back there, but, you know, there's, in Arizona, a large percentage of, of Hispanics voted for Prop 200. And there's lots of reasons that we can get into as to what that happened. But when the haves in the Hispanic community don't support what's happening to the have-nots, that barometer starts to go very, very slowly to, to, to such, a, such a bad place. 
that all that progressives are going to have left to support are, you know, are the most uh, uh, unattractive visuals of what this is all about. Well, this is, this is, yes, it's awful that people are dying in the desert and that they're dying in the ocean and that people have to cross over because they're poor and all of these visuals that it's very easy for people to look at that across the country and, and, and sort of separate themselves and say, that's not who I am. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that it, it's, it may not be who you are, but it is who you are as an American to make sure that, that those, those things don't happen. And so part of our challenge here is for us as Hispanics to understand that whether we are on the have or the have not side of this, that we have to figure out how it is that we leave our thumbprint. Because like all other, you know, if you were gay and you, you know, but you could fake it, being straight, then you didn't have to like push the envelope you know, like the Queens did at Stonewall, right? And if you were, you know, kind of a white acting black guy, you kind of got away and people said, yeah, well, you're okay. And if you were a louder black guy, then it, it's nothing new. It's nothing new. It's just a different, it's a different set of issues. And so those of us that, you know, can fake it <laughs> need to not fake it and need to be there with the rest of them. Very good. Gabriela, did you want to add anything there? Just, um, I would just say, uh, you know, because, I mean, we're also looking at this political fight, right? So from a strategic perspective, both things need to happen, um, both what John said and, and um, what Jorge said. Uh, you know, I think we need to help our friends. I think we have a tendency that when we know who our friends are, we forget about them because we just take them for granted. So we need to thank them and make sure that they're getting the letters and the recognition that, you know, what they're doing is positive because the other side is going after them. And then those who are on the fence and they don't know, we need to flood them with calls and emails and letters and 17,000 more letters and, and everything else um, and, um, and really get activated. I, I also agree with Jorge on, on the issue of uh, we have to unite our community. And we start by uniting our families first. And we have to talk about it. Um, every day I have conversations with Latinos. And, uh, you know, we get caught in the, we, we kind of get lost in the weeds there. We start talking about semantics and we need to focus on this word or that word. Let's focus on principles. We want family reunification. We want to ensure that people are treated with respect, that labor rights are protected, that, you know, if, if we do have a guest worker program, ensure that there's mechanisms in place so that those people, if they so choose, will have the op option of becoming legal permanent residents and eventually citizens. And if they want to go home, that they can go home. We've got to restore some of that migratory cycle back because at the end of the day, we're not helping our neighbors by pulling all their best and brightest out of their country. Economic development is critical for all countries. Um, and, and these are the kinds of things that we need to keep in mind. And lastly, I would just say, let us not forget that we've always stood for human rights and we need to continue to stand for human rights. Okay, we've got time for one more question or comment, just one, and I see uh, Supervisor Wilcox, please. Would you come to the front? Uh, Mary Rose, and we'll get you recorded as well. Thank you very much. And um, I think what you're hearing is absolutely true because Prop 200, which was the um, very, very um, aggressive bill put forward by the far right in Arizona passed. And yes, it's true. Uh, some uh, Mexicanos voted for it. But what happened is we came in too late uh, with the good education. You know, we could not get the funding uh, to run a campaign. Far right came in, fair came in, and just poured money. And by the time the election came, if we had had another two weeks, we would have defeated it because the margin was very low. It had started out very popular because it says things that make sense. It says things, do you uh, want services reduced because somebody else is using them who shouldn't be? And people look at it and they just don't understand it. We went out, we started educating, we started showing uh, the contributions of the undocumented community and we lost by a small margin. But the groups that uh, support these issues are so aggressive. And I also would like to um, just state a little bit more what's happening in Arizona. We have a county attorney who's trying to make his name on immigration. County has nothing at all to do with immigration, but he has put his name uh, with the far right and said, I am going to make my political career on this. 
I just come from a NACO conference, National Association of Counties, and everybody's talking about it because what he's done, the state passed a law and the governor signed it. Uh, there were 10 very punitive immigration measures. This was the least punitive that smugglers would be dealt with in um, a harsher fashion. She signed it, and now our county attorney is interpreting it that smugglers um, will be charged. Uh, the other day, 54 undocumented were picked up, being brought in by a smuggler in a van. And he not only charged the smuggler, he charged all of the undocumented um, because they aided and abetted the smuggler by paying him. And so now we have 54 people sitting in our county jail. Yesterday he added 100. And basically we're going to have to do public defenders for them. If they're found guilty, they'll spend two and a half years in a county jail at county expense. So it is very, very um, hard um, to look at these issues. And you have people who are going to make their name off them. So I think the best thing we could do is get out with information, be very aggressive in that information, and let people know, you know the truth and push. Um, we have two senators in Arizona, Kyle and McCain. Uh, one is the very progressive one with the McCain-Kennedy bill. The other stopped the Ag bill last year and is very uh, uh, behind everything on uh, immigration. This morning we met with them, and surprisingly, uh, Kyle said that he felt the judiciary would do something this year but even if they didn't get it through, they would look at the ad portion of the bill uh, to get relief. So I don't know if that's any uh, relief or not. But just wanted to update you and share in the comments that education, going door to door, getting um, a message simplified is very, very important because we started too late in Arizona and look what happened. And now we're just a hotbed of right and left on immigration. Thank you, Supervisor Wilcox. This will bring to a close our first issue hour associated with the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series. I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Remind you that our next event is June 14th, right here at the St. Regis. We'll select the issue at a later date. But again, our intention is to conduct the issue hour at 10 o'clock uh, each time that we conduct the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series event. I'd like you to join me in thanking our panel Gabriela, John, and Jorge uh, for their comments. And uh, before we give them a round of applause, let me uh, make one announcement. HBO Films, Mickey Ebot and Associates is delighted to be associated with HBO Films. And we have an event that I hope I see each and every one of you at a week from today. On March 15th at the Four Seasons Hotel, we will be screening, an advanced screening, of HBO's new film, Walkout, the story of the walkout of Chicano students in 1968 in five East Los Angeles high school, a story that needs to be told again and again and again. All of us uh, that are committed to the civil rights in our community, I think, will, will enjoy this film, produced by Moctezuma Esparza, directed by Edward James Olmos, both along with a number of the cast will join us. We will have invitations uh, following our luncheon today uh, at the display table as you depart. We'd encourage you to take one. Each invitation will allow you to bring a guest as well. However, we need you to RSVP as soon as possible in order that uh, you can secure a seat. This is limited seating, but I think it will be a very enjoyable event. This film, Walkout, will have its national premiere on HBO on uh, March 18th. Uh, again, let me thank our panel. Uh, please join me in a round of applause.